This is the story of a very bad marriage. This is the story of my marriage. And I don't think I've really shared it the way that I'm about to share it now because I've talked about certain things. And this bad marriage produced so many of the things, so many of the training, so many of the things that you see in the Hustlers Kung Fu catalog. I met my wife when I was in the military. And I was uh, Ray Carrillo. He was a friend of mine and I met her at a party. And I thought she was attractive. And then we started going out. Looking back, there was dangerous signs all over this relationship. I was in the military during Desert Storm and there was a potential for me going, being deployed across the way. And she was not sympathetic. She was frankly a bitch about it. And I was just like, that was the first red flag. And there was other red flags, but like many of you, I went ahead and married her anyway, even though there was all of these signs that there was just not good times ahead. And we got married and we had our first child, which was cool. That seemed to be a happy period. You know, there, there were some happy moments in the marriage, but there was this always this forbid, forbidding sense of hostility because I did love my wife, but upon retrospect, I never really liked her as a person because she was nasty and evil and racist. There were many, many things that went on, but me being a son of the South, you get married, you stay married, you take care of your wife, you take care of your family. And that's what I was doing. And the whole time I had a evil agent operating in my matrix. I remember I got out the military and we had been married for about a year. Then we had our first kid and I had set up a situation where I was going to be able to work Baylor and I was going to go to ITT of all schools for computer programming because I knew computers were the wave. I knew that was the future. And I got it all set up where, you know, and this was dependent upon her working and her income. So I come home after I get it all set up. She tells me that she quits her job. After we had extensive conversations about it, the, the, the grand plan, and I was like, that put me in a situation because I was a family man. I had to go to work. So I was working my full-time job on the weekends and I was working my full-time job during the week and I had to drop out of school. I realized that I did not marry a partner. I married someone who had an agenda. And I remember one point in our marriage when she got mad at me, she said, I could have married a doctor, but I married you with some stank on it. I mean, it was just really a venomous comment and there was this, I feel that she married me to get out of her mother's house because at the end of the day, I don't think that she loved me. I, I loved her, but I don't think she loved me. And then there was um, the thing, never marry someone who fights dirty. If they don't have the capacity to fight fairly, that is going to be so problematic later in your marriage. I mean, they will be going for the low blows, the snide comments, because at the end of the day, I remember growing up and there was this couple, um, the Lanier's. And I, you know, it was an older couple and I would go over and there were sometimes I would go over and I would get the feeling that Miss Lanier was mad at Mr. Lanier, but she would still fix his plate. She would still do certain things. And what I've learned is that people who love each other, even though when they're mad at each other, they still do the things that are required. They still take care of each other. That was absent in my marriage. I mean, we would get mad and stay mad for weeks. And there would be this untenable tension each night we go to bed. And I remember this saying from the Japanese, sleeping in the same bed, but dreaming different dreams. And I remember one night I was in the bed, I, I felt that there was this ocean 
of space and emotional distance between us. And we just never really on the same page. And ironically, I never cheated on my wife. I had opportunities, but I never did because that's not what a good man does. And I remember one night, someone that I had interest in before I was married, she let me know, cause she ended up working at Northside Hospital. She let me know that I can get what I want. And I was like, I'm a married man. He don't talk to me. Then I go home and me and my then wife get into the biggest fight we've ever had. And I'm just sitting there like, I work hard. I do the right things. I don't cheat. I don't beat my wife. I don't do these things. Yet I am constantly rewarded with angst and agony and tension and fights and bad words. And it, this went on. We hit a crescendo. One night I came home and she was in the mood. And I was in an okay mood. And, you know, she was just like, I'm going to call the police and I'm gonna tell them that you hit me. And me, being who I am, a smart ass, I hand her the phone and she dialed 911. At that moment, my blood froze because this was during the time of the Rodney King incidents. And um, 911, they were coming and then boom, 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 police knocking at the door. I'm from work. I am scared. I am really, really scared. I've never been in this situation before and then it just hit me the level of disdain and disgust that she had for me because I didn't hit her. I didn't touch her. And she used to hit me. That was one of her little games. She would like hit me, slap me upside the head, do all this other stuff. And then said, you, you, you can't hit a woman back. And the police came. And this was the time I was in really good shape. I was diesel. I used to work out of the gym down the street. I was about 245, rock solid. And the police took note that the fact that the way that I was built and the fact that there was no damage done to her, there was nothing done to her. There was nothing remotely done to her. And the one, this, this, I remember the blonde cop, he had the flashlight, he was looking at her face and there was a dark haired cop who was walking around and there was no furniture disturbed, there was nothing. And the cop said, frankly, man, I don't think he touched you. You don't know what a relief that was. You don't know what a relief that was. And uh, he said, due to Georgia state law, someone's gotta go. So at this point, she goes ahead, takes the kids and leaves with our only car, knowing I had to go to work the next day. And what I did is the next day I woke up because I worked second shift, I made a few phone calls and there was a girl who lived not too far away and she gave me a ride to work and brought me back home. And this is where it goes from bad to worse. When she left that night, not only did she tell her family that I hit her, she also told my family that I hit her. So she lied to the cops, she lied to her family, and she lied to my family. And here's the thing, everyone started treating me differently. And I didn't know why. And no one ever sat me down and said, hey, you know, what went down that night? No one ever asked me what my side of the story was. It was just like, okay, she wouldn't lie about such a thing like that. And I later on, I found this out because my brother and I got in an argument and he said, that's why you a woman beater. And I said, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, she told her what you did. She told us you beat her. I didn't touch that chick. And this was, you know, it got to the point that I remember I was having an interaction with her mother and her mother apologized to me because see, this is the thing when you lie like that, you have to keep telling lies. And then at some point, and this was years and years and years and years down the road, people started to put the pieces together and her grandmother said, you know, I met him. He just does not seem like the type of person to do something like that. Are you sure she's telling the truth? This is what her grandmother said. And no one wanted to listen to grandmother. And then years and years down the road, after all this damage had happened, all of the, the, the harm and the craziness happened, 
her mother apologized to me for treating me the way she did because she thinks she's like i think my daughter lied to me just looking at you know the way that you're dealing with your children and stuff it's just like this 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 doesn't add up and it took years and years and years for this to come out and once I figured it out, I was like, whoa, she had marked me. And this, this was the anger. And this is how I knew that she never loved me. This isn't something that you do to a person that you love. This isn't, you know, she turned my own family against me. She um, turned her family against me and she cons consistently lied. Now this is where it gets crazy. My daughter told me they were having a conversation and she told my children that she never loved me. She just married me because I was in the military. And she said the sex was good. And my daughter was just like, ooh, why are you even telling us this? And I remember there was a period that, you know, we had been divorced for a while and she called me up and she said, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm chilling. What do you want? They're like, I know you don't like me and everything, but can we, uh, you know, do the thing? I was like, no, I hate you. I absolutely hate you. There's no way that I want to do that with you. I hate you. And I hung up the phone. And that was the first time in my life that I actually told another human being that I hated them and it meant it. I hated her because she would do like, she would do stuff like this. Like she would send dirty clothes with the kids on their weekends to be with me. And then there was a time where she would just press on me. I need you to watch the kids and watch the kids. And I had a friend who was named Blue who I hired to watch the kids. And I called her up and I said, look, my friend Blue's gonna be at the house. You can drop the kids off. She's gonna watch the kids off till I get off from work. All of a sudden the emergency disappears because one of the things I've learned is when my ex knew that the kids were gonna be presented to other people and they were gonna know that she sent the kids to me. She used to send the kids to me looking like little raggle muffins. And there was one time where I was going out with my mom and my daughter's hair was pressed, they had on clean clothes. And I was like, ah, this is how you operate. So if you know that the kids are gonna be presented with someone else and they know that they came from you, this you don't like looking bad. So I started using that to my advantage. I started telling her stuff that I was like, oh, I'm getting ready to do this, getting ready to do this. And all of a sudden, a lot of that crazy stuff stopped. And then when I started making money, you know, um, I would go pick up my kids. Now, I had a friend who would let me, I, I, this, this is the craziest thing. Like this was after I had been in business environments and I had the brand new BMW. I had the common sense to not go pick up my kids in that new car. So I had a friend and I would always borrow one of his old cars to go pick up my kids. And I'm gonna tell you why I did that. One year, my sister let me use her brand new Toyota 4Runner to pick up the kids for Christmas. And when I dropped the kids off and she saw that new 4Runner, she clowned. Oh, that's how come I only get this little measly child support. You got brand new forerunners and everything. And I'm just sitting there like, cause my brother came up with me cause he's going to drive the forerunner back and drop me off. And I was just like, it ain't even mine. She didn't even want me riding nice. She was just, I mean, she literally clowned. She was living with her sister. Her sister is like, come, come down, come down. I had to pull her in cause she was clowning. And I, from that, I was like, you can't see me in something nice and clean because you're going to clown. And then the kids knew that I was doing well. And, you know, kids have conversations. They, they repeat what they hear. And she kind of had a feeling that I was making a lot more money. And I get this notice to go back to court. And at this point, I had learned the corporate game. So I went in there. And I just turned in my profit and loss statement and I adjusted my income to what it was when I got on child support. And they asked me and her attorney grilled the crap out of me. And I just kept, this is all I have to say. These are my documents. This is my income. This is where I'm at. I would never get into it. I never tried to explain anything. And the judge was like, no change in my, no, change, no modification change. 
And this, this is where I learned so many of the games because she was such a hostile, nasty, vile, mean person. And she was racist. She used to say some of the craziest thing about white people. She said, sometimes I like to look at them because they have colored eyes. She would talk about white people as if they were insects. And she was a Atlanta native. And she would um, say that she hated all the new people that were coming to Atlanta because they changed the, the, the complexion of the city, which really they did. And she seriously hated it. She used to be talking about it because if you ever met up with an old school native Atlantan, you would hang out with them. There was a Grady baby, Crawford Long baby. They had, you know, I went to Doug, I went to Benjamin Mays. They had their own little cliques. They had their own little language. It, it was wild. But here's the clicker. After all the nasty stuff she did, I didn't divorce her. She divorced me. Let me say this again. I didn't divorce her. She divorced me after all the nasty stuff because there was a point where we were not divorced yet and she had a job at this hotel and she was, one night, I think she was drinking. She called me up and she's like, you know, I've just had some of the best sex I've ever had in my life. I've been with a real man. I was like, congratulations, good for you. And she proceeds to tell me that she met this dude at the hotel and they would, take hotel rooms and do stuff between shifts. And I was like, all righty then. I didn't really care because I didn't want anything to do with her. And I was sitting there like, this chick is really crazy. And towards the end, when everything came out and the truth came out and her mother apologized to me and everybody knew what the truth was. At one point, my daughter just said, I'm out of here. And she left and she moved in with me. And I have a son who witnessed all of this, yet he chose to remain with his mother's side. So he and I don't get along. We just don't get along because of that, because he knew what went down. He knew the lies they were told. He knew the behavior and he still chose to go with her. And um, it, it's, it's funny. It, it's really, really funny. And this is the tale of a bad marriage. Never ever marry someone you don't like. That's one of my life's greatest lessons. I, I will never ever do anything like that again. It is one of the things and don't marry someone who doesn't fight fair. I'm telling you this, this will save you a lot of pain because when you're in that girlfriend and boyfriend stage and if they cannot fight fair and they're, they're, they're saying all kinds of nasty stuff and they're putting their hands on you, just walk away. Just, just walk away because it's, I'm here to tell you, it ain't going to get better. That's the prelude of the major crazy that's coming later. It ain't gonna get better. It's just not. And um, one of the things that you should really look at if you're gonna get married is look for someone who supports you and believes in you. I remember one time when we were halfway decent and I was like, I wanna be a writer. And she said, that's all well and good, but as long as you keep your two jobs and just walked off. No support, no nothing, nothing, nothing. No, no support whatsoever. And she did not support me. She did not edify me. She, I mean, it was just so bad. And I remember I was at a point, I was real deeply, deeply depressed because I was homeless. I was living in this boarding house, I had wrecked my car, I had lost my job, and I kept thinking of all the stuff that had happened and all the things that went down. And I think I was pretty much clinically depressed for about two years because it just literally sucks the soul out of you when you're dealing with someone who is just that nasty and vile. And like I said, I don't think, that, you know, she even told our children she never loved me. And with all of that, I still, you know, getting married and getting divorced is still one of my biggest issues in life. I did not get married to get divorced. That wasn't on my rape. I wasn't raised like that. And I, you know, I was like, I got married. I, I expected to be married until I died. And it didn't work out like that. And I learned so many lessons. And this is the stuff that I impart to you guys here. This is why 
I, I have all of these courses and this is why I have all, and this is why you don't see anything else like this because no one else has gone through this stuff to the degree that I went through. I literally was Humpty Dumpty, fell off the wall, got broken into a million pieces and I had to put myself back together again after this ordeal. I mean, it's, it, it's depressing to think about. It, it's, um, you know, and one of the things that got me, because like when she called the police and said I hit her and blatantly lied and put me in harm's way. And fortunately for me, the mayor of the police department, these police officers were doing their job. They came in, they were decent, they were kind, they were respectful, and they didn't just jam me up. And I'm grateful that those cops were doing their job. And I'm grateful that I didn't get arrested that night for something I didn't do. And this has taught me so much going through life. This has taught me so many lessons and things that I now understand on a deeper level about human nature and relationships and stuff. And essentially, Knowing what I know now, I would have like dated her for about three weeks and dumped it, just moved on. But at that time, I didn't have this knowledge. And you know, one of the reasons I'm sharing the story with you is to give you some insights because there are some of you who are in a similar situation right now. You're dealing with Beelzebub. That's why I used to call her the devil because they're not out for you to win. I want you to think, I was the only one working this woman called the police and said I did something I didn't do that could have had me arrested, could have had me spending money that we didn't have, all because she was mad. Just mad. I didn't do, really do anything to her. I had a slick mouth. I would pop back off on her. She'd give me some, I'd give her some. I didn't touch her, but she said I did. And, you know, and at that point, there was something in me that shifted when she did that. Because I'm like, now you know who you're dealing with. She will do that to you. She will go to that level. She will do that. And, you know, that was the beginning of the end. And about two years later, we were divorced. And one of the things I understood, because this, this is the craziest thing. I had so many good, wonderful, kind girlfriends that I look back and I could have like, I could have married her, 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 and none of this stuff would ever happen. I'd probably still be married. Wouldn't be dealing with this crazy, it's just, whew, end of the day, it's just horrible. And this is one of the things. And this has influenced my dating decisions because I, have never received that type of treatment from any other race. Not that level of a treatment, not even close, not even in the same zip code, that type of behavior. And that influences me because from a cultural standpoint, you know, before I met my wife, I had dated white women, Hispanic women and Asian women, and it was just a better fit. And, you know, I was kind of, Louis Farrakhan, I was kind of militant. I was like, I'm gonna marry me a good black woman, have some beautiful black babies. And that was an absolute disaster. That was just one of the craziest things that I've ever endured in my life. And this is, it was just a bad, bad marriage from the beginning to the end. And, you know, it's kind of crazy now that I have the perspective to look back on. And now I know why it happened because Female nature, a woman who, is, who allows her female nature to dictate her actions is capable of anything. And there are some good, sweet, kind women who have control of their female nature and would never do anything like that. But when you're dealing with a woman who has submitted herself to her wild, crazy female nature, run, just run, get get the hell on because it's going to be a carnival it's going to be a nightmare because this is a very impulsive person that whatever impulse hits them at the moment they go with it with little regard to outcomes and repercussions they just go with it i was dating this chick a lot of y'all saw bailey bailey was 
incredibly gorgeous, but Bailey was one of those chicks. And I, I saw the signs. I, one of the things I learned from my ex-wife was that low impulse control, certain behaviors, I learned to recognize that in future relationships. I was dating this girl who was outrageously gorgeous. Her name was Bailey. Bailey had been arrested five times, smoking, selling drugs, getting into fights with cops. And typically a girl that looks like Bailey doesn't have these kind of issues. And shortly after I saw the low impulse control, I, I just dumped her and kept it moving. A lot of my friends, because of the way that she looked, were like, where's Bailey? Where's Bailey? And a big part of maturing and growing up is learning how to accept and have things in your life that are good for you. And Bailey wasn't good for me. She just wasn't. She was a, a psychopathic, crazy chick. And these are the lessons I learned from my ex-wife because once I see that type of behavior, it's, 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 it's the end for that chick in my life because it, it doesn't get better. It doesn't get better because when I was married, my wife's behavior just got worse and worse and worse and worse to the NIF degree where she called the cops and said I hit her when I didn't. And one of the products that happened from that is I developed a very different opinion on paying, putting hands on women. I remember I was dating this chick and she just hauled off and slapped me. And at just a reflexive moment, I hauled off and slapped the shit out of her. And she was stunned. And I was like, you put your hands on me, I'm gonna put my hands on you. And she wanted to call the cops. I said, like, call them, I'm gonna tell them I was defending myself. And she never did. And we ended up breaking up very shortly after that because one of the things is that many women feel that it's perfectly acceptable for them to put their hands on you, but God forbid if you touch them back. Look, everyone should keep their hands to themselves. I have never hit a woman that has never hit me. I don't believe in it, I don't do it, and I don't conduct myself in that manner. But when you're dealing with a woman who's all about putting her hands on you, run. Because this is the type of chick that's gonna escalate things to the nifth degree and cause all kinds of problems and consequences down the road. There, there's just, there's a lot of women who are fundamentally unfair and it, it's just, oh, I can touch you, but you can't touch me, is some crazy crap that I don't deal with and I don't entertain that in my life. But hopefully this video helped you because I know there are some of you who are going through this stuff. I know that you're dealing with this crap. I know that you are having these type of issues. So go ahead, get yourself together, and I suggest you go down and get the Hustler's Mindset, Pimping Your Mind for Success, get that book, and then go ahead and begin to work through these issues because we as men don't really talk about the things that women do to us on this level. And this creates a lot of pain and resentment and mental issues. So if you are in a crazy relationship and you need to seek out therapy, go get yourself some therapy, go ahead and talk to someone and ease, unburden your mind. So this is Glendon Cameron and I'll see you guys in the next video.